Right, this is the AMC2 microphone preamp, a BBC design, very old design. And this is a very simplified circuit. We'll go to the real circuit later. This simplifies the feedback. It used an old, very old Pento, the AC slash SP3A. The A version was specially chosen for lower noise, probably a microphony. It looks like a triode, it isn't. It is a pentode, but for the simplification, there's no need to show the other grids. If you get a valve that is AC slash something, it means that it's derived from a battery valve, probably a two volt valve. What they did is they put in a cathode and a heater so that it could be used on an AC mains power supply at either 4 volts or 6.3 usually. This is a 4 volt valve as most of the old valves were on B7 bases. So what we have here is a preamplifier before a mixer um, intended for use with ribbon microphones. Now ribbon microphones have a very low output but very high quality. Almost certainly there was a built-in step-up transformer within the microphone casing because the input impedance of this is much higher than a ribbon. A ribbon is only a couple of ohms. They did a number of input impedances for this particular design ranging from 28 ohms, if I remember rightly, up to 300. The ratio of the input transformer for this one is for a 300 ohm, and it's 28 um, to, sorry, it is one to 28.8, sorry. Giving a very large voltage step up. They could have gone for higher, but they used the maximum ratio that was consistent with a good frequency response. One could have gone for say 100 to 1, but the trouble is the higher the step up ratio, the more stray capacitance in the secondary winding and the more um, leakage inductance, both of which will reduce the high frequency response. You will see at the input end there is a dotted resistor. This resistor does not exist, it is there for explanatory purposes. If it did exist, it will be 250k, which is what the transformer matches into. In practice, the actual load is these two resistors here. A quick explanation, this double bar was the way on this circuit they represented ganging between two switches. And please note that these apparent variable resistors are in fact switches, not pots. But again, for simplification, that isn't shown. You'll see it on the proper circuit diagram um, that I'll come to next. To vary the gain, there is negative feedback to the grid. To derive a feedback voltage, there is a resistor in the earthy end of the transformer secondary. The transformer is fed via a capacitor, so there is no DC current through it. Hence, the inductance of the transformer is not reduced by the DC current flowing in it, and the distortion and base response are both much better that way. But you don't get as much gain as you will get if it was actually in the anode instead of using a resistor. You will also notice that this decoupling capacitor goes back to the feedback point. What they're basically doing is feeding back any residual ripple into the feedback loop and it is then actively inverted and negated by negative feedback. This is a little surprising because in the full circuit you will see there is double decoupling of the supply. Also, in professional equipment I wouldn't expect to find any ripple of significance on the HT line, either because it was a regulated supply or that it was very heavily smooth, or that it was stabilized using a giant neon voltage regulator type valve. But anyway, they found reason for it. They also pointed out that they used a very large bypass capacitor 
in the cathode. That's 100 microfarads, which you may not think is very big. Well, by modern standards, no, it isn't. Um, but in the days when this was manufactured, that was quite a large capacitance. Um, nowadays, you get a tiny thing that was 1,000 microfarads if you wanted it. Anyway, to return to the feedback, which is the main feature of the design of this amplifier, as the feedback is increased by reducing this value of resistor, this resistor is increased. Not only does that increase the feedback ratio, but the reason of doing it in what appears to be rather a complicated way is so that the load impedance presented to the secondary of the transformer remains approximately constant at the 250k that I mentioned. Obviously as that is reduced you would finish up with a point where the resistance there was virtually nothing due to the feedback but the increasing feedback sorry the increasing resistance here with increasing feedback um, compensates for that to maintain the value. It does have the disadvantage that as you increase the series resistance, it actually increases the noise. But on the other hand, if you need the gain to be reduced, then it is reasonable to assume you have quite a high level input signal and therefore the noise will be drowned under the signal. The output is 600 ohms. To move now to the next circuit, the full circuit. So here it looks rather complicated so you can see why I have a simplified version to talk about. We have a small capacitor across the input. Um, these are done for tonal correction because you don't get transformers that are completely flat and in the days when this was manufactured that would have been more so than now. With better materials and understanding, one can get much better responses without equalization. It's quite often the case you find that there's an equalizing component across the secondary. Now, as I explained earlier, in reality, they didn't use pots, they used a switch. So you have 30, 40 and 50 dB gain positions. Except when you look at the specification, you find that the typical gain in all cases is not the 30, 40 or 50, it's less. Why they couldn't get these resistor values right so that they actually were exactly or very close to 30 or 40 or 50, whichever selected, is another matter. In one position, in the 50 dB position, they have to reduce the negative feedback because otherwise you get a frequency loss that is noticeable across the amplifier. So they reduce the negative feedback by having a capacitor there for the high frequency end which equalizes it. That capacitor remains in circuit in all three positions but because of the value of the series resistor one and a half megs it is basically invisible other than in the 50 dB gain position. When you go to 40 dB, for instance, there's one and a half meg ohms in series with it. So, as I say, it's effectively invisible. Notice that this is a plus or minus 2% tolerance capacitor. Even nowadays, capacitors to the 2% are expensive, and in those days, more so. It would have been selected from a batch, almost certainly, individually measured. There is a little bit more compensation here, which is in circuit the whole time, regardless of the gain. If we come to the valve, it is really very unsuitable, but it was what they had at the time. Basically, this is an RF amplifier with high current and for the time it was made, high neutral conductance of between 7 and 7.6 milliamps per volt, depending um, on the anode voltage and how it was configured. For audio work, that is not what you want. If you compare that to the modern equivalent, which is the EF86, I think you'll find it's 1.2 milliamps per volt, and the anode current would only be around a milliamp at most, 
um, whereas this valve was specified at 20 milliamps maximum. And the data sheet, apart from saying it's an RF amplifier, including for use at low VHF, and there's a video output valve in televisions. Uh, it's on the B7 base, and it would have been um, a television valve mainly in those days. It may even have found its way into a few radar units. It wouldn't surprise me. There is an alternative valve, a TSP from Mullard, um, which has similar, but in fact inferior gain uh, um, um, neutral conductance to this valve. Mazda did have a technique for making control grids, which meant that they could have much higher gain. Basically, they have discovered how to make them much more rigid, so the wires could be closer to the cathode and closer spaced without shorting. But anyway, this is the specified valve. They seem rather pernickety about the value of anode load in that they've got a 220k across a 22, giving about 20k. Yet, funnily enough, neither of those resistors are marked as being high stab or close tolerance. 20k is a preferred value in the E12 series of resistors, I think it is. So why they just didn't use that, I don't know. I doubt whether we can meet the designer at this stage to ask him. We have an output here, the total feed, which is a little bit strange. Um, you can measure the current drawn by the valve there, but you need to have a low impedance in series with the cathode, otherwise the thing won't work properly. Again, here they have a 2% resistor, so they were quite keen that the cathode bias should be of an accurate value. Note that the screen grid is decoupled to the cathode, as is often done in RF practice, um, a little unusual for audio. I said that there were two decoupling capacitors and I mentioned it went back to the feedback. Well, there is the second one after the second 4.7K, but I also said it was double decoupled and there's another 4.7K and 16 microfarads there, conventionally decoupled to the earth circuit. Here again we have a compensating capacitor. We also have to correct for phase, otherwise one is likely to get instability in the amplifier because of the phase change across the transformer primary when you have a lot of negative feedback. The output is always for 600 ohms. You had it on terminals, you had it on a jack. Here, clearly, they were not using a centre-tapped heater winding to feed this valve. And what they did is put a resistor from each side to earth, which is an eff effectively a centre-tap. Quite often for microphone and other high-gain purposes, and particularly I would have thought with an old-fashioned valve before we had valves like the EF37A and the EF86, specifically for very low-level audio, um, they would actually put a pot across the heater and one adjusted it for minimum hum. Now the purpose of this amplifier, they were built in blocks of four and they were separate to the mixing desk. In the days when this was designed, the mixing desks generally had the problem that as you adjusted the gain of one input, it affected the gain of the other inputs. One doesn't get that nowadays because one uses virtual earth mixing, but that was a technique not known at this time. And I'm not sure it ever was used with valve mixers. Basically, if you imagine a line of pots with signals on, their sliders have a resistor in to isolate it to some extent from all the other inputs, and that is fed to the grid of the mixer valve. The trouble is the bigger that resistor is, the more gain loss there is. The bigger it is, the greater the isolation, but you finish up with a very large reduction in signal if you go too far, and the noise of the mixer valve becomes important. And of course, being after the faders, that appears in the output. So by boosting the signal by up to 50 dB, before the input to the mixer, one can have a mixer that has quite a lot of loss in the actual mixing process and that was the, pro the purpose of these. 
One would have thought they would have gone for mixers with this circuitry built in, but for some reason, possibly because they already had their mixers, found them unsatisfactory on low level signals with um, ribbon microphones with their very low output. And they decided that they needed a fix. And the fix was to build this rather expensive box to be used externally. That concludes the, ACE, the uh, microphone preamp. If you found this tutorial very useful and would like to see more, then please subscribe to our YouTube channel, Patreon, Facebook and Twitter accounts. So far to date, we have covered dozens of vintage valve amplifiers and equipment, starting with basic items such as Danset, Bush and Philips record players, We've also covered the Mullard 33 and the 510 valve amplifiers, the mic amp and mixer circuit based around the EF86, the Hacker and Dynatron record players, uh, Leak TL10, Quad valve amplifiers, GEC MOV division, Radford, Pi, Dynaco Stereo 70, and many other British and foreign audio circuits. We are in the process of shooting lots more videos on a regular basis and we will be uploading often. We cover hi-fi, musicians and recording studio equipment as well as vintage radio circuits. Please go to the website for more details.